I'm Max Egan. I'm a mechanical engineering and MBA student at the University of Alabama, and I've been interning at Burns & McDonald, an engineering consulting firm based in Kansas City. I've always been fascinated by sustainable energy and have the awesome opportunity to experience renewable development here at Burns & Mac. My dad, who has been part of the manufacturing space for the past 25 years, has taught me everything he knows, and now's my chance to return the favor. So I invited him to explore the world of renewable energy and the people and places responsible for its future. This is Manufacturing Explorers. Oh wow, this place is massive. He said it would be easy to find. I am going to struggle, I think, here. Where's the front entrance? Right here, so we take a right. Max! Hey, Dad, been looking all over for you. How do I get into this place? Welcome to Burns and Mac, Dad. There you are. Excited to see you. After this awkward reunion with my dad, we headed out to Joplin, a remote part of the Midwest on the border of Kansas and Missouri. In the mid 1800s, 11,000 acres were left contaminated from hundreds of lead and zinc mines. This land was under the EPA-created Superfund program, which was responsible for cleaning up some of the nation's most contaminated land and responding to environmental emergencies, oil spills, and natural disasters. With the EPA wanting to transition this land away from being a Superfund, Liberty Utilities proposed a solar site. So with the help of Burns and Mac, they put in a layer of grass, constructed a road to avoid the mines scattered below, and built a community solar site on 60 acres of land, with 15 acres being used for the solar panels. We were here at this remotely operated test site to see what the future held for renewable energy. Hey Robert, good to Next. see you. Robert, how are you? Good to see you. What I'm Jason. Jason, Travis Egan. Travis? Nice to meet you. Jason. Nice to meet you, Max. Egan. Nice to meet you. So Jason is a substation project manager for Liberty Utilities uh, and was the project manager over this uh, uh, Prosperity Solar site here. So this is my first chance to actually see a solar array. Um, I want to learn a little bit. Can you take us over and, and yeah, absolutely. give us a little education? Saying uh, there's about 5,700 panels on this 11 acre site, uh, equaling about 2.5 megawatts DC. You know, in perspective, it's it's an average maybe a thousand ohms per megawatt okay. of use. The the panels are bifacial uh, what does that panels. Mean? So bifacial, uh, you have instead of uh, panels on the front side, you have panels on the back side, and the benefit there is the reflective off the ground. So you'll notice the uh, ground is kind of a brown texture as opposed to maybe a uh, dark soil. You know, not not as good as white rock, but not as bad as black soil. And actually, you know, we actually caught the EPA was initially to finish this site to put soil on top of this to finalize to cap it off but so in a sense we saved them a lot of money on soil so you saved the taxpayers a a few absolutely bucks. there you go <laughs> <laughs> what's the, what's a really big solar site is this is this a large solar facility right here or is there 10x that or you know what's i think this in comparison this is a being in a community pilot project this is a smaller a very smaller end of the of the spectrum and Jason brought up an interesting term here in community solar. As much as we want to see solar panels on every single roof in the country, we accept that's not quite possible. But for anybody who can't install solar panels on their property, or would prefer not to, community solar sites like this make it possible to still receive the benefits of solar. This site is like one building block of what you could just, you know, do over and over and over again to get that larger scale project. Even the, the um, cable system, uh, everything that they're doing here is, is how you would build that much larger site. It's just, like Jason said, it's on a pilot scale for them to be able to test everything. So you can scale it out over exactly. time as needed. Yep. How would you clean the panel? Burns and Mac interns, primarily. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Absolutely. Before I got put to work cleaning solar panels, I wanted to dig a bit deeper on a unique feature of this site. Starting around 11 a.m., these solar panels move with the sun through a motorized system to maximize the conversion of the sun's energy to DC electricity. I wondered just how much power was being used for this single axis tracking process. The cable system you see is a cab system, which goes in line with the above ground array technologies. Uh, on site, as opposed to having each 
each uh, string having its own motor, yeah. the whole site uh, has only three motors okay. uh, that run the whole site based on this worm gear type of arrangement. And so it, there's not a lot of energy. These motors are less than five horsepower. Uh, but as you can tell, I mean, it's, it's been moving since we've been here. The rays have been slowly moving. We haven't heard it once, I would mm -hmm. say. So it's very, very subtle. And you the said site. that they're, they're rotating only during, during certain hours of the day, though. Right, they're based on, it's based on a, uh, the time of day, right. pre-programmed pre in the PLC. So I think we've seen most pieces or components of this, but not the inverter, right? Right. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay. So what you have here is the inverter skid. Um, it came to us assembled, pre-assembled at the, at the factory. Inside the inverter cabinet, of course, is where all the DC wires come in. Um, all, the strings that, all the strings that we've talked about have nine disconnect points in the field and they come into the west side cabinet on the DC side is where they make their connection. On the east side is the AC cabinet, and on the north side is the control cabinet. And that's how it's sectionalized in the inverter cabinet. Um, on top you have what's making all the noise, of course, is the, the uh, fan-driven uh, liquid-cooled coolant for the, for the inverter. So where do we plug into the grid? Uh, there's an outlet inside here. There's a, there's a 120 outlet, you feel free to plug in. <laughs> I really appreciate you guys' time. This is great. I mean, it's such a beautiful part of the countryside and you know, you're taking up, I mean, solar takes up a lot of land, right? But at the same time, you're taking this, this super site, this, this area that, you know, is contaminated and it needs, something needs to be done with it. And this seems like a perfect uh, solution for that problem. So I really, really enjoy learning about this and seeing how it really impacts manufacturing and uh, impacts our lives. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. Enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Good meeting meet you guys. Thank you. Very well. Solar sites like these are a large part of the future of renewable energy, but it's not something they can yet achieve alone. About 30 minutes down the road from the solar site was Riverton Power Station. It was constructed in 1904 as a Westinghouse steam generator that supplied power for the St. Louis World's Fair. Since then, it has undergone some modifications with help from Burns & Mack to modernize this facility by improving efficiency and extending its life. The main attraction of this new combined cycle power plant is that it has a relatively small carbon footprint. Ed, how you doing? Hi. Travis Egan. Max Egan, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Ed Easton, I'm plant manager out here. Uh, welcome to the Riverton plant. Currently at the site, operational is units 10 and units 11, and then unit 12, which is part of the combined cycles. Can we go take a look? Yeah. I've heard or I've learned about some of these technologies in my engineering classes uh, so far. Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming we've got like a Brayton cycle in there, but then you bring in a lot of other cycles to make this combined cycle gas turbine. Right. The can bank, you, can the, you point some things out for us and yeah, um, walk through it? You've got the gas turbine, yeah. which is inside that building, which is the kind of the left end of it, you might say, and then the generators on this end. But that's where you create the heat at. You bring the natural gas in, you bring air in and you compress the air and you add the gas and you burn it at around 23, 2400 degrees. And then it goes through the turbine where it exhausts at around 1060 degrees. So that if that was a simple cycle unit, that would be where it would just be going to atmosphere. Right. When Ed brought us inside this facility, it was so loud we were barely able to hear, let alone capture the audio for this part of the tour. As a combined cycle plant, it's important to note that the exhaust heat from the original gas turbine is used to create steam for another turbine, maximizing the power generated from a single source of fuel. This is what really sets this facility apart and makes it more efficient. It was so incredible to see a facility and process that was over 100 years old, yet still held relevance in our push for renewable energy in the 21st century. So what we're looking at here is properly called Empire Lake, um, because we built it. It's, it's at the junction of Spring River, which comes down from the north, and then Shoal Creek, which runs south of Joplin, coming in from the south. And then we also have an overflow over here. Whatever doesn't overflow the dam flows over the, what we call the bypass. And the whole point of this lake is it supplies cooling water for the combined cycle. Before, it used to supply cooling water for the old, the old turbine. The old turbines, it had what they called a once-through cooling system to where you brought water in the river, up out of the river, 
you ran it through the condenser to cool the steam back down, and then you discharged it back into the lake. And that's what that water trough is right there. It's called the flume. Okay. Well, they passed a rule several years ago that said you couldn't raise the temperature of your lake with your water. So what we do now is we use this lake as makeup to our cooling tower because we're rejecting heat in our condenser, we have to reject that heat somewhere and that's through the cooling tower. So I've gotten to learn a lot today and I think my biggest takeaway is, is the importance of you know, some of these conversions that uh, have been happening with gas turbines over the past decade or two. Um, you know, Burns and Mack worked on the combined cell project to boost the efficiency of an already existing natural gas plant um, to, to help you know, generate more power and, and also as we transition away from you know, super uh, concentrated carbon technologies, uh, this is some of the technology that is, that's helping, helping us do that. Yeah, you, I mean, you hit it right on the head. I mean, th that's what we've done here. We took, we took you know, a gas turbine, we put the combined cycle in uh, with the help of Burns and McDonald, uh, with their design, which had a, a lot of unique abilities and made a much more efficient unit that better meets the needs of our customers and our shareholders. I mean, because this unit can start in one, you know, in a few hours, can shut down and can restart again the next day, which better meets the demand because, you know, there's just not near as much demand at night. So that's exactly right. Yeah, this is really cool. Thank you for showing us it. Oh, you're welcome. Glad I could. Yep. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for the great tour. I'll lead us down the, what, 178 stairs? Yeah. All right. Dad, what did you think? Incredible. I mean, it's been uh, a long summer of you talking all about renewable energy, and uh, it's been a lifetime of that, actually. But uh, it was really great to come and see what you guys are doing, not just here at Burns and Mac, but looking out into the field. And uh, my first time to a solar array or to a natural gas, you know, facility, and massive and really important to the future of our planet. Um, I don't Not know. something a lot of people think about either. Absolutely, it's like, uh, it's like the air we breathe, right? We don't think about it, but it's critical to, to everything we do. And, and so it's really good to have an understanding of why it's important, how it works, and Absolutely. where it's headed.